Hi. Um, this talk is on uh, WordPress development on Windows 10, a topic I never thought I would be speaking about. Uh, fortunately, I am at the Microsoft Nerd Center, so maybe there's some Microsoft people in the audience who can correct me if I say anything totally wrong. Um, hopefully not. But uh, no, this is a talk mostly driven from my personal experience the last, uh, I guess, two years now at this point. And it's, as I, as I implied there, you know, this is a big change for me. It's something I'm really excited about. And when they asked me to kind of jump in and do a technical talk tonight, this is the first thing that came to mind. Because it's something you don't hear about a lot, right? You go to tech conferences, you, you go to work, you see a sea of Apple logos. And Apple makes awesome hardware. I'm a big fan of their stuff. I've got a couple of classic Macintoshes behind me in my office. You know, when I go on video calls, people always ask. I've got a Mac Plus and a G4 iMac. I'm a big fan of their stuff. But I'm also becoming kind of a Windows fanboy, which, again, it's a shock to me, but Microsoft has been producing some amazing hardware and some amazing software. And especially when you consider the prices of the different offerings from the different companies, there's really a strong advantage to some of the Windows hardware out there, especially if you're running a business. Um, you know, there, it's really hard to justify that added expense. So bit about me, I'm Dave Ross. I'm a Associate Director of Engineering at 10UP. We're a uh, WordPress-focused agency, 100% uh, remote. Uh, we have a lot of uh, team members who contribute back to the WordPress community in various, uh, in various ways from full-time. Helen Hosandi uh, works for us. She is a core, core committer, I believe, is her uh, and release lead. Um, we've also got people who contribute plugins and themes to the ecosystem and also people who commit unit tests and code to WordPress core itself. We're big fans of the software and the community. We primarily make enterprise-grade publishing platforms built on WordPress, React, all sorts of modern technologies, and um, we power a lot of big publications on the web and corporate websites, and also uh, not-for-profits, some smaller uh, businesses and organizations as well. So a, a wide range. Uh, go to 10up.com. We, we have a section kind of showcasing our work, and you can kind of get an idea of the kind of client base we're dealing with. Um, there's also a couple ways to get in touch with me uh, online if, if you really want to. Um, I have kind of a shortcut there to get to my LinkedIn page because it's like linkedin.com slash 12345 slash D slash whatever. So uh, if you go to davidmichaelross.com slash go slash LinkedIn, it'll redirect you. And I thought I should start this presentation with a moment of silence for WAMP. <laughs> okay, good. Nobody's giving me a weird look. Um, I think you all can understand that WAMP is, WAMP was an amazing piece of technology when it first came out. For those who don't know, WAMP is kind of a Windows version of the LAMP stack, right? It provides Apache, MySQL, and PHP compiled for Windows, set up for web development with a nice GUI that lets you turn different features on and off. When I first started doing uh, web development uh, on Windows 10 years ago, 15 years ago, it was a lifesaver. It really was. There was nothing like it at the time. And I don't want anything I say in this presentation to disparage WAMP for its, its role in really bringing web development to the masses. It is a great tool, but I think we've moved beyond it. And again, I want to share some, some techniques and some technologies I've been playing with that really enable me to do very powerful modern web development on the Windows platform. So moment of silence for MAMP, please. Okay, so here's my story of how I came back to Windows after probably 10 years uh, using OS X. Um, this is, there's a case study on 10UP's website, so I don't think I'm giving away any corporate secrets here, but uh, the Microsoft people in the audience, you know, you might have snipers hiding somewhere. Um, Windows 10 had a big publicity push around its launch. And Microsoft had several websites. Uh oh, you're texting the Microsoft people, aren't you? <laughs> the, 
when they had several websites that were going up around midnight, I believe Pacific time, to talk about the impending launch of Windows 10 and really drum up excitement from people because there really hadn't been that much excitement around a Windows launch in a long time. Let's, let's face it, Windows 8 just was kind of lackluster. 8.1 was good, but it wasn't quite that exciting. They really wanted to, to highlight all these exciting features coming with Windows 10. And I was part of a team that was putting together what we called the Windows 10 launch landing page, which was a site on the Windows blogs uh, web page that was going to talk about, first of all, it was a free upgrade. Come on, it doesn't cost you anything to try it. And it talked about some of the really exciting features like Cortana and the Edge browser. And it was going to offer press materials for free download. If you were running, uh, say, TechCrunch or something like that, you could go and get videos and photos, high-quality stuff to, to post on your, your site, on your news site. We also had a section highlighting tweets from around the world of people who had just upgraded and were really excited about it. Um, it, was, it was a really fun site to put together, and we got to work with some great people at Microsoft putting it together. And nobody on the team had a good way to test it because we were all Mac people. You know, a lot of web developers were at the time. And so, and, and Microsoft had this new Edge browser coming out, which was kind of like Internet Explorer, but kind of not. And it was only going to be available in Windows 10. So I went on eBay, and I picked up a very beaten up Microsoft Surface Pro 2, which um, I don't know if you've seen them, but they're about an inch thick, okay, a little thinner and a magnesium case, and, and you could prop a door open with it. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's still a tablet, but it's kind of a brick. But um, I got it, and it, the back was all scratched up, and I'm like, I don't care. I'm just using this for cross-browser testing. And I would test this website when we made revisions, and I'd grab the latest version of Edge from the Windows Insider program, and I'm like, eh, as long as I got this, I might as well check my email, and I might as well uh, do a code review while I'm on this thing. And next thing I knew it, I was using it for more and more. And I had a Mac and a Windows machine on my desk, and I said, this is too much. Okay, I'm becoming that guy from the Matrix with like 10 monitors and all these keyboards, and this is crazy. Could I realistically do my job at 10 up in Windows? And I had to think about this. And, you know, okay, as a, as a director, as a manager, there's a lot of things I do on the web, right? I, I read Gmail. I, I use Basecamp. I look at uh, Git repositories through a tool called Beanstalk. Okay, all of that, that happens in a browser. I can run Chrome, no big deal. But when you start getting into tools like Vagrant or Composer or PHP itself, I mean, I remember running, trying to run these things in Windows, you know, a decade ago, and it was just, it was so far removed from the reality of running these programs on a server, on a Linux server, on a BSD server. Uh, version, earlier versions of PHP even had problems identifying paths on Windows. There was a change, I believe, in the 4.0 days where they had to fix it so you could refer to paths with forward slashes, and it would say, ah, I'm on Windows. Okay, I need to turn those into backslashes. I mean, stuff like that just didn't work out of the box. And, but you know, I started trying things out, and I started experimenting, and I found that, yeah, I can do more and more of my job on Windows these days. And that was really kind of a revelation for me. And frankly, I put that MacBook Pro in my desk drawer, and I've barely looked at it in the past probably two years. Um, I've upgraded to a Surface Pro 3 now. Um, it's a much more powerful machine, much more lightweight. It has replaced my iPad. And uh, for my personal, you know, surfing and ebook reading and, and that sort of thing, and um, as well as I use it for work with a 27-inch monitor and a 23-inch monitor and a docking station and everything, it is a very powerful operating system and a very powerful piece of hardware. One of the first things I tried to get going on uh, Windows was Visual Studio Code. And this is a, a cross-browser text editor that Microsoft put together. It's completely open source. It's, uh, if you're familiar with At Atom or Sublime Text, it's very similar to those. It's based on Electron, so it's, written in, it's a text editor written in web technologies. 
uh, running in, in an embedded browser. Uh, it looks just like a des desktop application. But um, they've done a lot of performance tweaks to it, and they're very cognizant of the performance and the battery usage on it. And I found it to be just as good as a native text editor, kind of like Sublime would be. And I don't want to dwell too much on it um, because it is, I mean, let, <laughs> if, if you're looking at this, you're probably looking at this going, didn't you just pull up Sublime? I mean, it's got the, the mini map on the side. It, it's got the text window. Here's a list of all the programs in the current directory. And really, yeah, if you're used to working in that kind of environment, then this, this is an editor that could work for you. One of the advantages, though, of a tool like Visual Studio Code is they have a really deep extension eco ecosystem. They have a lot of tools written by Microsoft and third-party developers that really enhance the experience. Probably a lot of the same ones you'll find on those other platforms, but I've found the, the ones for Visual, Visual Studio Code fit my workflow really well. And out of the box, you get a very powerful search, again, kind of like Atom or Sublime. Built-in Git integration, which is really nice. I can start editing a file here and save it, and it'll tell me, hey, you've made a change here. I can add it to a change set. I can revert. Um, again, you know, you can add a plug-in to those other, other editors and get similar functionality. Here it is right out of the box, built-in Git integration. Uh, debugger uh, integration, uh, you can hook this up to xdebug to debug PHP um, if you're working on WordPress. If you have a Node.js application, you can connect to that. There's an open source protocol for connecting to Node.js right now. Very similar to um, pretty much any uh, IDE that lets you do step debugging. You know, you can step into, step over functions, um, really get into the, the nuts and bolts of how your code is executing. And as I mentioned, there's a very deep plugin, in, uh, or sorry, extension uh, ecosystem. They call them extensions. Um, and these are some of my favorites here. I'll go into them in a little more detail on the next slide. Um, WordPress Snippet is a really nice one that I found that um, offers autocomplete for WordPress. So if I were to start typing good old, you know, we talked about hooks and filters earlier. If I start typing add filter, it's going to say, hey, I know what that is. That hooks a function or method to a specific filter. Uh, okay, that sounds right. Let's pick that. Boom, it tells me all the parameters I need to, to use that. Again, I, I've, you know, used very expensive IDEs in the past uh, to do code editing, um, Eclipse, you know, even... Uh, they're, they're very heavyweight, um, they, they take a while to load up, they, they have a ton of features, but this really let, offers a lot of the same power, but in a very lightweight editor. Uh, PHP Code Sniffer is a really nice one. It, if you've ever used PHP Code Sniffer, the command line tool to look at a piece of code, and it, uh, it uses sniffs, which are just a set of heuristics that kind of point out issues in your code. Uh, there's a set of WordPress-specific ones um, that kind of point out uh, deviations from the WordPress coding standards. Uh, TenUp is very big on those. We require our engineers to, to run checks against their code to make sure it fits the WordPress coding standards and make sure it gets you know, the very obvious errors like unescaped output. Um, in Visual Studio Code, I have an extension loaded to run PHP Code Sniffer. And here I have a piece of code from WordPress core. And it is not showing it now, is it? <laughs> what the hell exists? Error reporting. Now I wonder if it's because I expanded the font size. Anyway, as you oh, there it is. So PHP Code Sniffer found an issue in a core file of WordPress that this line of code does not match the WordPress coding standards. It's missing a space before this last uh, parenthesis here. So if we go ahead and add that, it should clear it out. Yep, there it goes. 
like I said, very handy. It's not going to catch every bug. It's going to catch code standard issues uh, that make it a lot easier for other developers to pick up your code and look at it because it's formatted consistently. Um, and it's going to catch you know, very obvious coding issues. Um, you still need to do a thorough code review of your own code and other developers' code to, to make sure it's up to speed. Uh, PHP debug hooks into that debugger interface, um, makes it easy to, to connect to xdebug and step through your PHP code. Git lens is a really nice one. As you can see here, it's calling out this is an un uncommitted change. Okay, big deal. But um, if you go to code that's already committed to your Git repository, it'll show you here just in line, it shows the commit message, which is kind of nice. And if you kind of mouse over it, it'll give you a nice pop-up with the full Git commit message. And this is really nice if you're working on code with other developers. You can kind of see, who, they call it the blame feature. You can see who modified a line of code and get in touch with them if you have any questions. And editor config is another thing that 10up is very big on, at least our engineers. And editor config is just a standard for a text file that sits in the root of a project. And it basically specifies, you know, the old argument, if you've ever watched uh, the TV show Silicon Valley on HBO, you know, tabs versus spaces, it's a relationship killer. Okay, with an editor config file, you put a file in the root of the project that says tabs. And no matter what the person uses for their own, you know, pleasure for however they prefer to code, when they hit save, it's going to convert it to tabs. When you commit to the Git repository, it's going to make sure it has tabs. Everybody's on the same page. Again, it's those common coding standards that keep everyone able to work together without fist fights. So, and it's great. I barely scratched the surface of the kind of extensions that are available. It. There's a lot of built-in support for JavaScript and Node.js, but the uh, plugin ecosystem has a ton of stuff for PHP, uh, some WordPress-specific stuff, um, Go, Python, all sorts of different languages. It's really becoming a, a versatile editor, and it's available for Windows, Mac, and Linux. So when I made that jump over to Windows, it was no big deal to just download it and start using it on Windows just as easily as I was on Mac. So really worth checking out. Um, again, a, a wonderful open source project, completely free of charge. Chocolatey is something that really made me feel at home on Windows because if you, you've, you're used to uh, Linux, you know, you have package managers like Yum or Apt. Um, even on the Mac, there's um, Homebrew. Right, you can brew install and then an application and it'll go out and install Apache or MySQL. Uh, Chocolatey provides that for Windows. And it's going to be really hard for me to do a demo here because we're kind of limited by all this shared bandwidth that we're sharing. But let me just do a Choco list local only. And you can kind of see I've got some pack packages installed right now. I've installed Node.js, I've installed Python through the command line, and it's really, it's as easy as working with apt-get or homebrew, it's choco install python3. And it'll go, and it says, oh, I'm not running from an administrator shell. But um, if I were, um, choco install python3. Just like apt, just like homebrew, it's going to go out to the internet. It's going to go get a pre-compiled binary of it. It's going to install it. Uh, a lot of times what it's doing with these is somebody has packaged up the regular installer, you know, click next, click next, click next, and just automated it with a script. You're still, you know, asked to accept the license terms, and then you just go. And it'll still show up in add and remove programs. But if you want to kind of script uh, installing software on a new machine or you just want to hop in the command line and start working without having to click on every, you know, click GUIs and click next, next, next over and over, this is a really quick way to get up and running. And it, as I said, it's something I really missed moving from a Unix-type operating system. It's, it's really handy to have a, a feature like this. MSYS2 um, is a modern upgrade to a, a project called SIGWIN. 
Uh, SigWin was designed to add a POSIX layer to Windows. Um, to, to unpack that a little bit, um, when you have a POSIX is kind of a common language for Linux and all the different BSD operating systems and Solaris, basically all these Unix style operating systems to basically run the same code as each other. There, there's obviously a few little differences. I mean, that's why we have different operating systems. Everyone does something a little different. But it's a common standard that allows them to more or less interoperate. And Windows was always kind of off in its own little world. Um, SigWin and then uh, MSYS2 kind of picked up after it. It, it really, um, it, it brought all these tools into the, the Windows world. Um, probably the best way to explain it is if you're familiar with the Windows DLL, it's just a library file, right, that different programs can pull in. MSYS2 sits there, and they've compiled versions of common Unix utilities, things like LS, GRAP, AUK. They've compiled them against SIGWIN, or MSYS2 in this case, and they run natively on Windows. So you can see on a command prompt here, um, if I do uname a, there's a Unix command, you know, uname, and it says I'm running msys on Windows NT. I'm running on a 64-bit operating system. I can do ls. I can cat license and grep for GNU. Is that going to work? No. Why is it not seeing license? Oh, because this is uh, <laughs> this isn't WordPress itself. This is one of my projects, so it's an MIT license. So let's just grep for Dave. There it is. Um, you know, just running. If you if you fingers just natively type ls instead of dir. If you're used to grep instead of find, this makes the Windows command line so much more powerful for you. It makes it feel like home. All. I shouldn't say all. Most of the commands you're used to using are going to be there for you. Um, you can. Do, it, it comes with an SSH client. You can add your SSH keys and just SSH right from the command line, like you were sitting at a Unix terminal. Very, very exciting for me um, because you know after you, I ran Linux on a laptop for several years. I ran Mac OS X for the longest time. And, you know, you, you get used to it. It's kind of muscle memory. You get used to doing things a certain way. And this allowed me to start doing it that way on Windows. If you want to take it to the next step, right, we talked about uh, WAMP, which had versions of Apache, MySQL, and PHP compiled for Windows. And we talked about how those aren't always exactly the same as running them on a Linux server. If you want to take it to the next step, you can use a tool like Vagrant or Docker to run actual Linux in a virtual machine on Windows. And if you've used something like varying Vagrant Vagrants to, to do WordPress development, you understand that having an environment that closely mirrors a production WordPress uh, server is, is a lifesaver because you can make sure you're running the exact versions of PHP or Apache or Nginx that you're used to. Um, you know, you can test for those weird little edge cases. You can test an upgrade. If you want to upgrade to PHP 7 for a website, you can upgrade within that virtual machine without touching your main system and just test out a website, see how it works. Uh, that's the way I prefer to work with, with WordPress. Again, because I develop on Windows, but I'm deploying to everything from... I don't want to say inexpensive web hosting, but, uh, you know, um, managed web hosting, um, all the you know, Rackspace, a uh, place like that, all the way up to WordPress VIP. Um, even we have some clients hosting on Microsoft Azure. So being able to, to have an environment that simulates production more closely is, is very valuable to me. So let me go back to my... Uh, Administrator command prompt here. Let me open a new one. Where is administrator? Yes.
Um, I won't show Vagrant because it does take. It, there's a common joke among web, web developers. If you type Vagrant up to start a virtual machine, you, you got enough time to go have coffee and watch some TV, and it's going to be a while. So I'm just going to do a Docker Compose up, and this is a virtual machine that, uh, or a Docker setup that I developed. Uh, it's available on my GitHub. Um, a lot of people at 10Up are starting to use uh, WP Docker, I believe it's called. Uh, there's lots of different people out there who have put together Docker configurations for WordPress development. And it's going to start up a, a set of uh, Docker containers. Uh, if you're familiar with Docker, it, it doesn't create virtual machines. It creates little isolated sections of a Linux install that are kind of separated from each other. Nice thing about Docker on Windows is it runs under Hyper-V, which is virtualization built into the operating system if you have Windows 10 Pro. Uh, so you don't need to install VirtualBox. You don't need to install VMware. It's just there. It's free. You might as well use it. You can see here that Docker has set up what they call Moby Linux, because Moby and then their logo is a whale. Um, it's set up its own virtual machine for running Linux. It's running actual Linux on this machine. Uh, it's allocating a gigabyte of memory to itself. Uh, it's grabbing as much CPU as it needs. And it's allowing me to have a complete... Which window was it? <laughs> it's allowing me to have a WordPress development environment running uh, on actual Linux on my Windows box. And as I said, that, that is very powerful for being able to test and debug in an environment that very similarly matches your production. Yes? Uh, I actually had a question for you about mm -hmm. Vagrant and this sort of touch on Docker? Yeah. How some of the plugins for like Vagrant and a lot of Windows, like DNS Mask or some of the others, third party? Mm, iffy. It depends. A lot of them do work very well. Um, some of them don't. Uh, there's one to update your host's file that I've never got working. So I have to go in and update it manually. Um, that's one reason why I did switch to Docker. Um, one thing I've found is things are getting a lot better for, for Windows development, um, you know, doing web development on Windows, but a lot of people don't develop and test with it in mind. Um, so I have had to um, commit changes, you know, do pull requests to various projects. But for the most part, things just work. Uh, the, the Vagrant plugins are an example of things that don't always work. Yeah. I wish I had better news for you. <laughs> okay. okay, Docker didn't start correctly, but let's, let's move on. Because um, I really wanted to get to something that's really exciting to me, and this is a fairly recent change. Um, it's called Windows Subsystem for Linux. This takes that, um, that Vagrant and Docker kind of thing and take, uh, even takes MSYS2 and, and takes it one step further. Uh, this is something Microsoft, they, they call it a beta. You know, they want to make it very clear this is something still in development. It's still evolving. It's still growing. As with a lot of stuff Microsoft is doing these days, it's open source. So they're looking for your feedback and your criticisms and your ideas for how to make this better. I mentioned that SIGWIN and MSYS2 is like this little library that sits there and lets you compile Linux applications to run on Windows. This is a little more hardcore. This is a kind of Skunk Works project within Microsoft that built this translation layer that sits inside the Windows kernel and says, hi, I'm Linux. And when you can run actual Linux compiled binaries, and it just takes the Linux system calls and maps them to Windows system calls and translates the response back to what a Windows or what a Linux application would be expecting. Um, so a lot of Linux applications like uh, Bash, GCC, people have even gotten uh, X Windows running under this without hardware acceleration. It is, for all intents and purposes, a Linux machine without the Linux kernel. It is, it is very exciting for me because it takes out that extra layer kind of in between. And this is the Windows kernel just running all this stuff natively. It, it's very powerful, really good performance. Um, I'm really excited by it. When you install it, it kind of goes by the original name. It throws an icon up on your start menu that says Bash on Ubuntu on Windows. 
And that's what, when they first started talking about this, when they first released it, this is what it used to be called. But they've done a lot of, a lot of changes to it. And they've, they started trying to port other shells to it. So if you're used to working in ZSH, or if you're like me, you like to run fish, those run natively in this now. You can open up a bash ZSH fish shell on your Windows machine, and your, your Windows C drive is mounted under MNT slash C, and everything else is, it actually goes and downloads the user space of Ubuntu 16 and runs it on top of Windows. Again, it's not a virtual machine. It's the Windows kernel saying, I'm Linux. You know, talk to me like I'm Linux. The community has taken this a step further and said, well, if, we can just down, if we're just downloading a user space, do we have to run Ubuntu? You know, what if I, I host my websites on a Debian server? What if I host on Fedora, CentOS? Um, what if I want to use Alpine? They, there's code out there on GitHub and various community projects that let you install a different type of Linux to run connected to the Windows kernel like this. It offers a ton of flexibility, again, to match that production environment that you're, you're trying to deploy code to. And I you know, was trying to think of an exciting demo, and to be honest, I really couldn't. I can, I can run Uname, and it says right there, you know, it's running Linux and you know, LS. Um, I can you know, do the, the grep thing again if, if you really want to see that. But there really is no good demo because it is Linux. Um, it, it is, you know, honest for goodness, Linux. Um, and that, again, that, that removes that extra step. It makes it a lot easier for me to have run the same commands that my peers who are running Mac can use, uh, deploy code the same way I would on a production server. It's, it's an exciting addition to the Windows ecosystem. And it, I, one of those things, it, it's hidden behind a settings menu. You have to turn on developer mode. They throw up a big warning. Okay, you're, you're going into developer mode. Your system reboots, and it's just available for you. And it's, it's pretty cool. Um, thank you. Any questions? Yes? I did Drupal development for about five years, so I got really ingrained into doing two spaces, and I'm having a hard time breaking that habit. When I do JavaScript, I tend to do tabs, but I also leave semicolons off. So I don't know what that says about me. Well, I actually have a different question. Yeah. So in, in the VS Code, what, uh, do you use any plugins to uh, synchronize your settings between machines? No, but um, like Atom, and I believe like Sublime, it stores its settings in a JSON file. So if you want to just store those in a, a Git repository or something, it's really easy to synchronize that. And it just stores it in your Windows home directory, C, users, and then your username. So again, kind of like, uh, kind of like a Unix system, you know, you're, you're maintaining your dot files and Microsoft has kind of picked up that standard and they're, they're really trying to make it easier to, again, for people switching from other platforms to get up and running. Anyone else? Yes. Yeah, my wife gave me a really hard time because I used to walk past the Microsoft store at the Prudential Center and laugh. So <laughs> she's like, "You're using, you're using, you're using Windows. What's going on here?" Are you? She was, she was going to have me, you know, see a, a psychologist because you know I was the biggest Mac person for a while. Um, all kidding aside, it, it was a very smooth transition. Um, I think the biggest transition, you know, problem for me is. Um, one password. Uh, the Windows version just isn't as slick as the Mac version, and it, they've done a lot to improve it. But when I switched, it wasn't. It, it felt like a clunky old Windows application. So I migrated everything to NPass, which runs on. Oh my God! It runs on Windows. It runs on Mac. It runs on Linux. It runs on Windows Phone. If you're one of the 0.8 percent of the people still using it. Um, they got desktop version, Windows Modern. It, it runs on anything. And I've, I've found it to be, to be really nice. That's E-N-P-A-S-S. -S. Um, that, that was kind of a point of friction for me. Again, 1Password worked fine, but it, was, it just felt so out of place with all the really nice modern Windows applications. 
Um, font rendering just isn't as nice as the Mac, and if you're used to staring at a Mac screen for eight to ten hours a day, it really, it's jarring at first. Um, Chrome uses its own font rendering, which doesn't look that appealing either on Windows because they're really focused on the Mac. As I said, some of the open source software did have kind of hiccups, so I've contributed changes to, to various uh, projects over the time. But yeah, for the most part, it's been really, it's been really smooth. Um, pretty much everything we use at work has a Windows equivalent. There's no sketch for Windows yet, but I don't do much design. Um, so MS Paint is usually good for the kind of things I'm doing. Um, obviously, if your workflows at work uh, involve Keynote or Pages, um, I still get people who send me docs from those. I have to upload those to iCloud um, and, and edit them over the web. Uh, some things work, some things don't. I collaborated on a presentation. We lost all the transitions because of that. But um, at least it let me go in and create some static slides, and then we were able to integrate the two presentations together. I mean, you're going to deal with that, right? Uh, Mac PowerPoint, I don't think, has 100% parity with Windows PowerPoint either. So th those are really the kind of things you need to work, uh, worry about. But it, it wasn't as bad as I was expecting, especially because so much of modern life happens in the browser, and I can run Chrome. I, Edge is actually a really good browser, but the extension ecosystem isn't that good, and I've got things like harvest time tracking where I just click an icon and it starts a timer for me, and I don't have that in Edge, so I still run Chrome. Anyone else? All right, well, thank you very much.